Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures, Daily Dose of Nature. Today's topic, a grizzly bear's journey from cub to adult, presented by NADHAB expedition leader, Eddie Savage. I'm your host, Rob Mess. Thank you all so much for being here today. Over to you, Eddie. Great to be back. Having a little bit of internet connectivity issues. Um, hopefully it doesn't persist throughout the presentation, but uh, uh, hopefully you can hear me loud and clear. Um, anyhow, today I'm going to be talking about the journey of a grizzly bear. Um, my work in the Great Bear Rainforest in Canada, um, I've been able to go back to the same estuary in the same place year after year, uh, coming up on, on 11 years now. And something that uh, perhaps is not extremely well, grizzly bears, in particular coastal uh, uh, coastal bears is they have very small ranges, in particular the females. Um, female bears can be, you know, 40 kilometers squared to 250 kilometers squared, um, usually encompassing uh, several valleys, um, inlet, like a one inlet or a few bays, coves, uh, a couple of river systems, that kind of thing, but really not an expansive distance. And a lot of that has to do with the density of food and the concentration of food, in particular in mountainous coastal region. I think I know what the issue might be. I just, uh, I have a newborn baby and we have a baby cam and I think the Wi-Fi from the baby cam might be interrupting my signal. Anyhow, um, continuing on, uh, here's my short disclaimer um, for this presentation. I'm going to refer to a number of grizzly bears by names. Um, and something important to note is that they are not pets. Um, I use names specifically in my presentation for identification purposes. And, uh, we have extremely, I have extremely strict viewing policies and throughout British Columbia, we have extremely strict viewing policies and uh, as far and training as well as far as going to view bears. So it's not like we just go to an area and decide to name these bears as you know our friends and that kind of stuff there's not that personal connection it's instead of calling this bear you know bear a b zero zero two five um we go and we give her the name in this picture her name is amber um and a lesson with that is folks always respect bears um, that is your key to safety in bear country is respecting about bears and bear behavior and that kind of stuff. So that's my my little disclaimer for this presentation. Um, with that being said, uh, why do I want to share this bear's journey? So the bear that I'm talking about today, um, it's a bear that I know as Amber. And working in the Great Bear Rainforest, I have gone to the same cove um, and seen this bear uh, grazing the same sedge patches and rolling over the same uh, rocks on the same, you know, muscle and barnacle clad beaches for for uh, over 10 years now. Um, she is a staple and I've seen her not just through an adult life, but I've seen her all the way from when she was six months old until she, uh, until the last time I saw her, which was, uh, I haven't time there in the last several years. So the last time I saw her was 2019. Um, but uh, yeah, so I just wanted to give you insight into a year, or not just a year in a bear's life, but kind of the progression you um, can have throughout their life. And, and in areas where you're going and viewing bears consistently over not just, not just a few months in like the fall for salmon spawning season, but actually throughout the entire year that, you know, from when they emerge from the den in the spring until they head back into the den in the fall, um, you kind of get an idea of what their entire year is, and then kind of you get a, a bit of a life history for these individual bears. And in areas around British Columbia, Alaska, throughout North America, um, where you have kind of these viewing operations that go into the same place, the same time um, throughout the year, you can you can really build up a catalog of life history of of grizzly bears, um, which is really exciting. So that's why I want to share. Kind of the life of this bear as far as I know. I'm sure there's tons of stuff that happens behind the scenes, but I'm going to share with you the life um, as observed by me in the wild of this one individual grizzly bear. So it starts in 2013, um, and this is 
Uh, Amber, uh, she's one of the cubs. Her mom is a bear that we know as Bella, and her brother is a bear uh, we call Frank. Um, and so that's the first time I got to see them. And now 2013, this is also a younger version of me. Um, back in 2013, it's the first time I had already been guiding, um, leading trips for about five years, but it was the first time I'd actually uh, entered into the grizzly bear viewing world. So this was all very new. And I think that's something kind of special about recognizing um, this particular bear is, is so she was she was a very young cub and i was also a young cub in the the bear viewing kind of world in that sense so let's talk about bella so bella is a bear that's been coming back to the same uh cove area um or cove and kind of region of, of the british columbia coast uh, uh and observed um from in this one area for over 20 years um she's had several sets of cubs throughout that time um, and in the, a, a grizzly bear life expectancy is kind of 25 to 30 years and females can be reproductive from about six or seven years all the way until their mid twenties, um, if not their late twenties. Um, she's had multiple sets of cubs, um, a very high success rate as far as uh, raising them from, from a cub of the year all the way um, until they're a little over two years old and then kicking them out. Um, but here's a couple of pictures of her. So she's very recognizable. One of the main uh, things that's recognizable about her is actually might be hard to see in these pictures, but um, on her nose, and I, I think I have a, a better picture coming up on the right hand side of her nose, she has a little scar. Um, so she can change a lot throughout the seasons, but very recognizable. We know she's around and we know it's her because of the scar on her nose. Um, which is kind of her define a defining facial feature that she's got. This is uh, Amber's brother, uh, uh, um, Frank. So they spent a lot of time when they a lot of time together when they were young. But this is Frank actually was taken when he was two, or they were both two and a half years old. They were both kind of in the same stretch of of rocks, but they're they're really small bears. They're the lowest lowest bears on the ladder, and so if they ever encountered any other um, bears, whether that be a mom with cubs or an adult male or an older subadult, um, they'd always get kind of pushed away from the better feeding areas. So they're in like this really rugged, steep, kind of muscle clad, uh, rocky area that's outside of kind of the better feeding zone. There's still lots of food for them. It's just a little harder to get, um, which might explain why uh, Frank decided to have a snooze here on the rocks, uh, very close to the, very close to the water. So probably got woken up when the tide rose and touched his paws. Here's another picture of Frank when he's a little bit older. And then here's a picture of Frank and Amber when they're about three and a half years old, uh, wrestling in the estuary. So let's go back. 2013, Cup of the Year. Thank you, Dr. Melanie Clapham, for this photo. Um, all grizzly bears, um, typically, they're well, they're born in the den, uh, kind of in the, the early or I guess right at the beginning of the year in January. And they spend the first couple of lives, um, or a couple of months of their life in the den. It's a bit of an external womb where they essentially are in this protected area that's insulated from the outside world. On the coast of British Columbia, these dens are usually at elevations of, of around kind of 800 meters or so, um, around 3000 feet, um, areas where they're gonna have snow for a long period of time not going to melt and and kind of wreck the structure of the den um, or flood the den in that sense and so that's where they start their life they would have emerged um, likely right around now or or in mid-april usually mums with cubs of the year young bears are a little bit later um, than the other bears they take a little more time coming down from the mountains um, as the little bears have uh, their some oftentimes they have their own agenda ultimately they're going to follow mom but they also have their own agenda they're curious and they're just not as fast moving and as, as focused as an adult bear um so this one's amber in 2013 and something else that happened in 2013 um was there was a documentary crew that uh, had come to uh, this area of the coast i was working at a place called night on Light lodge um, for the duration of, of this presentation. And um, they hosted a Disney film crew who spent two seasons or two years um, at the lodge. And then the second season they were there in 2013, 
2013 is when I was there. They spent um, a lot of time looking for Bella and her cubs, Amber and Frank, um, and they filmed them. And so this picture is, they, they, they kind of split the filming into two spaces. They, one of the filming was up in Alaska where they were filming a mom with cubs in Alaska. And that's where the movie is actually set, this Disney Nature Bears film. Um, but in British Columbia, they were focusing on kind of the, the, uh, the, the comfort of, um, of filming with, with Bella and Amber and Frank. And so here's a great picture. I just uh, got a circle there to show you the scar on her nose. So that is for sure Bella. And I'm not sure if this is going to be Frank or Amber at that age. But um, so they were featured in that, that documentary or kind of not, not so much a documentary, but more of kind of a, a story of the first year of a bear's life. And a lot of that filming happened here um, uh, with, with Amber and her brother and her mom. Here's another picture of her as a very tiny little cub. And a lot of the year, basically, it was just mom and her two little ones avoiding all the other bears and, and trying to make a good living. Um, all along the coast, feeding on sedge and mussels and barnacles, and and Amber and her brother were doing a lot of nursing and and spent a lot of time together. Just these are some of my early pictures. You know, it kind of feels like uh, it kind of feels like I've just um, I just picked up a camera for the first time, and uh, so there's a there's some grainy shots, but you get the point. Um, but yeah, so a few pictures of, of Bella and her two cubs in that first year when they're very small. Here's a one of my favorite shots of Amber just standing. She's super, super small, probably the size of a basketball, um, just trying to figure out the world. Now, mom, so Bella, Amber, Frank, they would have gone into the den um, after the fall, after that winter. Um, the cubs would have gained a whole bunch of weight. Mom would have gained a whole bunch of weight. They go back up into the den altogether. And then when they emerged in the springtime, um, after that kind of abundance of salmon and all the nutrients and fats that come through the fall, uh, Bella, Bella's cubs, Amber and Frank, had a bit of a growth spurt. And here they are in 2014 as yearling cubs. So now they're about a year and a half. Um, they showed up in amazing shape. And they basically spent this year kind of roaming around, uh, learning as much as they could from mom. So the yearling cub phase, or this is this is kind of when they're a little more self-sustaining um, because they they're big. They can chew their own sedge. They can chew their own mussels and barnacles um, quite efficiently. They can you know they can maybe catch their own salmon if they're bold enough. Um, they're still nursing from mom. Um, because uh, not only is it a, a little bit of a food source, it's less of a food source at a year and a half, more of um, a comfort. So if they have a stressful encounter like this previous one where mom and her two cubs kind of encountered another bear and they had to make those negotiations, um, there's a lot more nursing that happens simply just to keep um, mom and cubs kind of, or keep the cubs kind of relaxed and happy. Um, and as well, once you get to uh, the yearling stage, they've got a lot more energy storage. They've got a lot more, um, they just, they've got a lot more curiosity. They've also got a real knack for uh, learning about uh, sparring and wrestling with each other. And I just, I, I can't, I can't even count how many times I just kind of cruise along the shore and I'd see Bella kind of peacefully feeding over in the sedge, almost like you know, I'm sure if there's any parents online, they had this way, if they had kids around the same age, they just kind of let, it's like she would just leave the two kids to do their thing, wrestle as much as they wanted and, and take off uh, and, and just kind of stay away and, and have a snack. Um, so yeah, lots and lots of wrestling, lots and lots of kind of exploring uh, a really strong bond um, between siblings. Um, but also something that came up in 2014 was um, there was a really abundant salmon year. We had over 300,000 fish come back to this one river. Um, uh, however, it was a very warm summer and we didn't get rain until very late in the season. And so almost half of those fish died in the river before they could even spawn. And it was just basically this, this boon of of protein floating out the river and all the bears were fat and happy. They, they didn't have to expend energy trying to hunt fish. They, they basically were just like kind of 
and a very, very much so waddling around uh, picking up fish that, that kind of didn't make it because of the warmer weather, um, and with the warmer water. Um, and we saw some really extraordinary things that, that Amber, Frank, and, and Bella all took part in. Um, and that was social behavior, social play. So there was this instance where, I'm, where, I, where I took this photo. Um, there was two sets of yearling cubs, um, unrelated, that were playing together. That's why we see these four bears. So Amber, Frank, and then two other bears that are, are not really that well known to me. Um, uh, two other yearling cubs that are not well known to me kind of came and they all were playing in the shallows, gulls all around, occasionally stopping to pick up some dead fish to eat. But it was kind of this really extraordinary social behavior um, that I, you know, it, it's just not really written about um, or it, it hadn't been kind of discussed uh, much by the scientific world that, you know, kind of that, that abundance, that, that relaxed play between different families of bears. And what I thought was really interesting, and I have another picture of this in my archives, but um, the, the two moms were kind of sitting over in a deeper pool, like not really close together, but, you know, maybe about 12, well, I guess really close together considering the size of the area, but about 10 to 12 feet away. They were just sitting together eating salmon and all the kids were all playing together, um, which I thought was super, super interesting, super different. Um, and what came out of it was actually this, this paper, um, Social Play in Wild Brown Bears of Varying Age and Sex Class. And so in addition to this, this kind of social play that, that was observed, it wasn't just, um, it, there actually ended up being two other bears that were actually sub-adults, two and a half year olds, so older bears came over um, and they were also trying to get in on the, the wrestling that was going on with these four bears. Um, that bottom right picture, you can kind of see um, one of the moms in the background kind of feeding, not not paying too much mind about what the cubs are up to. Um, and here's another picture. And let's just, you know, you can see you got the two moms, you got the cubs kind of floating around. Um, and then, yeah, there was two other bears um, that came over that were a little older. And actually, I think that, let me just see here. Yeah, so the the bear that's in the foreground in this picture is I'll just get my my uh, laser pointer. So this bear that's in the foreground here, this is a bear we know as Lillian or Flora, who is a year older than all of the other four cubs. And she had come over to wrestle as well. So you've got two adults and you have one, two, three, four year and a half old bears. And then you had uh, Flora and her sister Lillian um, that were two and a half years old had just been kicked out. They came over and they were also wrestling and playing. And so it was just a a sea of bears. Um, another picture there from, from that experience. So already a pretty interesting life for this young bear. She's been featured in a documentary uh, or in, in a Disney film and then also um, featured in a scientific paper. Um, very, very interesting. So anyways, moving forward, um, that fall, um, Bella, Amber, Frank would have gone off um, and gone up into the den, um, hibernated together, and then came down in the spring of 2015. Now, early in the spring of 2015, um, mom and her two cubs might have stuck together for a little while, but typically at about two, two and a half years old is when uh, the grizzly bears will kick out their cubs. It doesn't always work out that way. Sometimes it lasts longer, sometimes a little bit shorter, but usually it's right around the two and a half year mark. And so she maybe weighed, I don't know, 150 pounds. She was a, she was a small bear um, when she was weaned um, by her mom. But her and her brother, being like I mentioned before, kind of the, the low bears on the bear ladder, um, they stuck together. So they're still trying to figure out how to be bears, how to, how to kind of run their own bear show, how to, how to go to work, catch the salmon, eat the sedge without the protection and strength and guidance of their mother. So they would have had to do a really good job learning from um, their mother before, but they spent 2015 together. And this is in the fall, um, Amber was looking really good. She had just chased some salmon, came to a deep spot, paused for a moment. And then on the other side of the river, this is shot in the same, the same frame or same kind of same day. Um, her brother was on the other side of the river, uh, also looking for salmon and kind of traveling a little bit. 
And here's an example of that. So we've got these two, these two uh, Amber and Frank. Amber is at the back and Frank is up front. Frank, being a male bear, was already kind of showing that he was going to be a pretty big bear and he was growing a lot faster than his sister. And, and just kind of as a comparison, you can tell that this is a spring photo and these are fall photos because look how kind of lush and thick and 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 kind of full they look. So a lot of that is their fur. Some of that is going to be salmon, salmon weight getting ready for hibernation. But in the springtime, when they come from hibernation, they have their short. Um, they've they've basically rubbed off or scratched off a lot of their heavier winter fur. It's a lot warmer, um, and they have the short summer fur as well. They're not carrying that hibernation weight, and so they they look a little more lean. Perfectly healthy, just a little more lean. Now, something else that that Amber did, she is an incredibly smart bear. Um, these logs um, are kind of anchored in the in the cove as a bit of a breakwater, and they've been sitting in the water for I don't know 20 years, 15, 20 years, maybe longer. Um, they basically protect um, uh, kind of the the buildings of Night Inlet Lodge from from the waves of uh, of the northwest wind. Um, the swell that comes in from the northwest wind. And so at very, very low tides, the logs that were closest to the beach would actually be would actually land on the beach and then lift up out of the beach a little bit. And Amber, as the smart bear that she is, she, she probably was walking along that beach and saw that, hey, look at the bottom of these logs. They're covered in mussels, big, you know, big Pacific mussels, a um, couple inches long or more. And she started eating them. And then the real curiosity and the real intelligence came in when she kept coming back even at high tide you know most bears would just come back and feed off the the logs when the mussels were exposed from the water but what she ended up doing is she would basically lay on the log on her belly reach her paw down underneath the log and scrape off um, the hidden mussels and she did that all the way along these logs um, eventually we ended up having to move her away from camp because it was just a little bit too it was too close to to a lot of human activity, um, too close to a lot of stuff. So we ended up gently coaxing her off of these logs, um, but she definitely got a good majority of those uh, those mussels before she she kind of went off and found other food sources. But here she is. So this is at the end of um, 2015, and she is looking pretty healthy. Or no, maybe this is 2016. I might have missed the date there. Oh no, yeah, end of 2015. This is the last photo. This is the last bear that I saw of 2015 and the last photo, uh, of course, that I took of a bear and it was Amber. She came for one last look um, in the creek for some fish, at least in this area, um, swimming around, golden fur. Uh, you can tell by kind of her, her back there underwater that she's in pretty darn good shape. Now, let's go to 2016. So. At this point, she would have gone off in den. She might have been close by to her brother, not, not usually sharing the same den, but probably close by. Um, and this is what she looked like in the spring. So she's looking a lot more like an adult bear. Um, definitely kind of filling out stronger, um, more muscular, um, longer legs, longer torso and more of an adult looking face. So at this point in 2016, she's three and a half years old. So grizzly bears reach breeding age um, between five and seven females, between five and seven years old. So she's still uh, got a little way, little ways to go. And she spent a lot of the, a lot of the spring by herself, but she was still a pretty small bear. And, <clears throat> excuse me, she was actually quite reluctant to leave her brother's side. And so there was there was kind of some negotiation. It's almost like her brother had to find ways to um, separate himself from her um, because he was, you know, he's three and a half years old, but he's starting to get his kind of individualism and, and male grizzly bears. What they like to do is they like to roam. So they typically leave their mother's range. Um, and they don't really come back. And that has a lot to do, you know, it's kind of a natural form of gene dispersal. The males don't breed in their mother's range. Um, and the females will basically usually stay overlapping within their mother's range, but the males typically don't. So he was already trying to kind of pull away and be a little more individual. Um, and unfortunately for Amber, um, she got the cold shoulder from her brother more often than not. 
<coughs> excuse me. And even in in one situation, um, it was really this is this is in the springtime. Amber was like hanging out with her brother, or trying to follow her brother where she was going. But there was two female grizzly bears. This is um, a bear we know as Flora. I, I think I already talked about her in another slide. And her sister Lillian. They're four and a half years old. They're not they're not of breeding age yet, but they were what appeared to be courting um, uh, courting Frank. And they were kind of following him around and like sleeping next to him and laying next to him. And Amber was kind of getting the cold shoulder from all three of them, kind of like, you know, go away. And this is a very dramatic scene where Flora was trying to push Amber away, but Amber kind of got stuck on this little peninsula of rocks surrounded by water. And she just went up to the high point on the peninsula on this rock and stood her ground. And they both froze in this posture for a good 30 seconds, kind of as they were negotiating. And then eventually Amber's just like, I'm not moving. And she laid down and put her, put her hand on her paws and Flora kind of turned around and went back. And Amber just ended up staying on the rock for a while and the other three moved off. So it was a lot of that for, for much of 2016 where um, Amber was kind of trying to follow Frank, but Frank was not very interested in having his, his, his sister around anymore. Um, and they, they did really um, ultimately part ways at, by the end of 2016, which is, which is typical. Usually it happens a little earlier, but um, for them, you know, again, smallest bear on the bear ladder or on the lowest rung of the bear ladder. So they, they stick together for strength. Now, 2017, I didn't, I didn't go back in 2017, but I got some great photos uh, from a colleague of mine, uh, Holly Galloway. Um, and she, yeah, so she photographed Amber and you can really tell. So this is now, she's four and a half years old. Um, this is her sopping wet, really short fur, but she's really starting to take on the appearance of an adult bear. And another thing that started to happen in 2017 is she started to gain the interest of some of the younger male bears that were around. So she's not necessarily in breeding. She's not necessarily breeding yet, um, but some of the other bears might be starting to get interested in, and those things, that that whole process might be starting to to work uh, in her favor. So, but she spent most of 2017 um, on her own. There was like this picture here. This is a a bear that we call Toffee. He's a male that comes back in the springtime every year. And she was seen with Toffee quite a lot. Um, we also have trail cameras there um, on, in the forest. And she was seen kind of together with Toffee quite a lot. And she was um, recorded. Um, they were they were recorded breeding. But again, she's young. So she was four and a half years old. So it might not have happened or she might not have gained enough weight um, throughout the fall to actually support cubs. Because when she came back, in 2018, she was still on her own. And this is springtime, Amber. She's still on her own. She's looking around, you know, spending a lot of time on her own. She's very healthy looking. Um, she definitely started to get more attention from the adult bears that were in the area. Um, but still, she was she was quite a small bear and, and um, definitely stuck to her own most of it, most of that here. Um, and like this picture, I, I think she looks a lot like her mom, Bella. Um, she's starting to kind of take on that, a very adult looking bear. Excuse me. Now, 2019, this is when things got very interesting. Um, 2019, she was spotted. This is Toffee again. She was spotted with Toffee as well as other bears um, for much of the spring kind of like two to three weeks. There was a lot of a lot of time spent together with Toffee, a lot of time spent together um, with other male bears. But in this one here, you can see Toffee is actually um, investigating for, for estrus. Um, and I did observe Toffee try to mount Amber once and Amber kind of slinked away, didn't work. But there's a lot of hours that I'm not out there looking for, uh, looking or watching um, the bears and so, you know, there's a good chance that they did breed successfully. Now, a little later on in the spring, um, there's also another bear um, that came by um, and they were seen uh, together for quite some time. And there's one piece of evidence here that suggests that she had been breeding. 
um, quite a lot. And that's if you look at the, the hind here, you can see there's a, this lighter patch of fur and the rest of her still has a lot of winter coat going on. That is likely from the male bear mounting her and basically just the friction of the two. Um, uh, it can pull out some of that, uh, that longer uh, guard hair that, that essentially is gonna go anyways, but it's just, that's where the friction is. So there you go. And then she was seen again with another bear. So she, she did breed in 2019. Um, she she definitely spent time with multiple males and she would have been 2019, five and a half years old. Um, and yeah, that was kind of the last time that I that I really had um, a good amount of time viewing her was both in the spring and the fall of 2019. Um, but something else came about in 2020. So she became the face of um, this new artificial intelligence facial recognition software for bears. This is really cool. It's a project of, uh, of Dr. Melanie Clapham and the Bear ID project, which is based that, that is based in British Columbia. The, the idea being kind of using images, high quality images of bear faces. Um, you can take the different dimensions of their face um, and essentially match that picture or that, that picture of a bear with a, an already cataloged bear. And Night Inlet's great for this because we, had all, we have had a catalog of not only images, but also DNA samples of about 60 bears um, from uh, kind of a long period of time of uh, camera trap footage, as well as these barbed wire hair traps. They don't actually break through uh, the fur at all. Um, they they just kind of the, the first way way too thick for barbed wire to actually get down to the skin and so the barb would pick up a little clump of hair and match that with the motion sensor camera trap pointed at it we could get this individual came through at this time this is their clump of fur send it off to dna and we can put a picture to a dna uh, sample and then with this ai software we can then take a picture of a bear and then put it in and say, okay, it's this bear. And then based on the DNA, this bear is related to these other bears and get a better idea and understanding of kind of what's going on um, in not only in, in our vicinity, our neighborhood, but also um, throughout, get a better idea of uh, grizzly bear population dynamics in British Columbia as a whole. And it's something that we do hope, or that, that the, um, the Bear ID project certainly hopes uh, will kind of expand and stretch uh, to further uh, further grizzly bear habitats and further grizzly bear populations. Uh, it's pretty interesting, but I, I do encourage you to check it out, bearresearch.org. The Bear ID Project uh, is, is pretty darn. Oh, there you go. So to recognize 132 animals, and that was in 2020, so there's probably a bunch more now. Um, in closing, first off, I just want to share with you one of my favorite um, photos here and and this has a lot to do with amber and kind of the the rich life that she's seen um in closing i would i would like to say that i have not seen amber um since 2019 um but if she did have cubs there's a chance that she may be she, she may have taken those cubs to another valley um where a different valley because you know kind of she has this new liability of the young cubs with her so she may have taken those cubs to another valley that doesn't have a bear viewing operation and she could be kind of looking for that um, less less busyness the the area where i've seen her is one of the highest densities of grizzly bears on the british columbia coastline and there's a lot of bears in close proximity and there's a lot of there's a lot of breeding going on in the springtime and so if you're a new mother with young cubs um, you're not always going to be interested in, in being around kind of that high tension activity, uh, you know, bears moving quickly in and out of areas, lots of courting activity and, and that kind of stuff. So she she may have just chosen to um, to spend time with those young cubs a bit further away. And if she did have cubs in 2020, she would have kicked them out um, in 2022. And so there's a potential. And then following that, she would have bred. There's a potential that this year, um, when I go back to that area, I could find her with a second set of cubs. If she's, you know, become a little bit more confident, she's going to be, you know, over 10 years old now, um, a little bit more confident and 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 comfortable moving around 
uh, other bears with a set of young cubs. So that's pretty cool. Now this photo um, of Amber, you can see her up on the rocks. Um, this is one of those moments when she was very young and she had basically been pushed around the corner uh, from some of the primary feeding sites. And you can see just how rugged and rough and steep that terrain is. Like that is not an energy efficient place to hunt for food. It's a sheer rock face. And she's like tucking up into these little crevices to get bits and pieces of muscles uh, clinging to the rocks. But what I love about it is we we were viewing her. We were probably a hundred yards off off the the rocks, and um, we heard these Pacific white-sided dolphins coming um, from our from our left. And basically, I just stopped. We shut down the boat, let the dolphins come, and uh, while we were watching the dolphins. So was Amber, uh, such a such an interesting curiosity. Um, I absolutely, absolutely love it. So I, I sure hope to see her again, maybe 2023 is the year, um, but uh, she could have also moved off to a different, a different part of the coast. And with that folks, uh, thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed kind of the life and times of this, uh, this beautiful young grizzly bear that uh, has gone all the way from cub to adulthood. and is now starting a life with her own cubs. Um, if you'd like to, you know, see some more pictures and stories and stuff like that, I've got lots going on on Instagram and Facebook there. If you wanna, if you wanna touch base there. Otherwise, thank, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, there we go. All right, thank you. Now, before we start with the question and answer session, I would like to remind everyone that you can submit your questions via the question field in your control panel. Okay, can I ask you who decides the names of the bears? So that's a good question. You know, oftentimes they, at least in this region, it's it's usually after a geographic feature. Um, in the past, it wasn't always that way. It used to be kind of like just up to the guides um, that were working in that area or up to the, the folks working in that area. But um, in more recent days, oftentimes it comes to like either like there's there's two bears that are called Flora and Lillian. So there's a mountain that's called Flora Peak. Um, and then there's another mountain that's called Mount Lily. And so that's why we've we've got Flora and Lillian as, as bear names. And then we also have like Keok and Hoya. Um, these are place names um, of the area where we're viewing. Do the bears get tagged or radio collared so that, that they can be tracked? So there's there's there is some of that going on, but not necessarily in our region. We actually find that like if we go back for like with grizzly bear research, um, kind of the more invasive methods of of tracking and collaring bears and understanding kind of range and movement, um, a lot of that's already been done from like the 1950s on. A lot of that's a lot of that has already been accomplished with radio collars um, and whatnot. And so most of the research now. Um, in particular in BC is kind of these non-invasive methods, methods using barbed wires um, that don't actually hurt the bear. They just pick up a little bit of fur using trail cameras um, to kind of see interactions between different bears, bears following other bears, um, bears using scent marking trees. Um, and with the barbed wire, we're collecting DNA samples and all that kind of stuff, all without having to use hides, tranquilizer guns or helicopters. So we can get a lot more information um, with these non-invasive methods over a longer span of time than kind of intensive uh, kind of aerial radio collar kind of stuff and, and stuff like that. So uh, we, I think that at least in British Columbia, most of the research has shifted away from that, that type of thing. So it seems like Amber might show up in somebody else's uh, photos. Is there any way to data share or um, follow these bears around at all? So I don't I don't think we've got like a, a map plotted. I haven't I haven't checked the bear ID project um, site to see where they're at, but I don't think there's a, a specific map um, plotted where the individuals are found, but something that has been worked on in the past and it's something I, I'd have to check on with Dr. Melanie Clapham is um, a database. So they're always looking for new photos um, they're always looking for new photos of bears to input into the database, and I've been I've been pinged a few times by them to to send in good face photos um, to help not only build 
the the database, but also it's part of programming the AI. The more faces that their bare ID software has to recognize, more bare faces that bare ID software has to recognize, the better it'll get at recognizing. And so um, as far as citizen science goes, um, in the region where we are, kind of that's like the main focus, um, which is kind of the the south Great Bear Rainforest region. If bears are seen in that area, um, that's kind of where the Bear ID project is is pulling facial recognition from now. But I would say a future goal would be to have it coastwide and probably including Alaska, because there's a lot of there is overlap among ranges and that kind of stuff um, between bears in Alaska. They don't recognize a land border. Um, and that kind of thing. So in particular with males that can have ranges of like 2,500 kilometers squared. Great, wow, thanks for addressing that. So yeah. do we know why their ears are so small, relatively speaking? Why their ears are so small? So, I mean, grizzly bears of, of a lot of bears, they've got pretty big ears. They've kind of got these big, big rounded ears, but they, the dominant sense of a bear, of all bear species, is not going to be their hearing. They have hearing that would be similar to ours, so they don't really rely on it as much as their other senses. They have long snouts um, and a big, big, long olfactory or a larger olfactory gland and a big, long snout with lots of turbinates inside the inside the nasal passage, so that they have an increased sense of smell. And they're the like grizzly bear, polar bear black bear, all the bear species have an extraordinary sense of smell. And so that's kind of their main, their main focus. That's what's really going to be, um, uh, yeah, it's going to be focused on is their sense of smell. Whereas their sight and their hearing, you could kind of compare those to ours, but they're, they're not going to be as, as keyed into the world um, as their sense of smell. They're, one of my favorite sayings um, is if a leaf falls in the forest, the eagle sees it, the deer hears it and the bear smells it. Um, just to kind of exhibit that eagles have an exceptional vision, deer have exceptional hearing, bears have exceptional smell. So I would say that their their small ears have a lot to do with that. It's not it's not a, a dominant sense, and there's no need for them to be very very large. So once cubs are weaned and have gone their separate ways, will they recognize each other if they have? if they encounter each other in the future so that's a really good question and it's definitely something that is kind of being researched there's already there's the question you know would a mother recognize her past offspring um, based on their scent um, would a male be able to recognize um, one of their offspring because they males don't take any part in in the whole cub raising process but except for the breeding portion, they disappear. Would a male be able to recognize their offspring based on their scent? Um, and I'd say when it comes to bear research in general, this goes for all species, kind of one of the frontiers of bear research right now is definitely scent and scent communication and scent recognition. Um, it has been suggested in giant pandas that giant pandas can recognize their offspring. Um, I've observed it in grizzly bears, way down the line that um, a mother has in some sense, some sense, um, pun intended, uh, has in some way recognized the scent of, of offspring. There's also stories of older cubs or, or sub-adults that have been recently kicked out by their mother, um, you know, four and a half or five and a half years old before they're really breeding, um, coming back and assisting their mother um, in some way. We're, who knows if it's actually assisting or if it's freeloading? It's hard to say, but basically the 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 sub adult would come back and be with that mom and the young cubs. And so you can have kind of like these cubs or bears of different ages following around the same adult mother. Um, so I think it is it is one of the great mysteries of bears is exactly what's going on as far as their scent recognition, scent communication. We know that it's exceptionally good. We know that they can smell things a lot further away um, than, than we can. Um, one of my favorite examples of kind of the importance of their sense of smell um, is I was standing, like a, a bear will stare at you. If, you. if that bear is upwind of you and it can't smell you, a bear will like look at you and kind of like look around and be curious about what you are. But, but I've had it before where I've been standing there holding a boat, you know, in about a foot of water 
and I've had a bear do a full 180 degree arc around me, you know, half a circle all the way around me um, until it was directly downwind. And it had been looking at us the whole time. You know, this is a boat with people in it. Me standing there in waders, we're an object on the horizon. We're not all that far away, maybe 50 or 60 yards away. And the, the bear circled all the way around us until it was perfectly downwind. And then it smelled us and it just like, okay, it has now confirmed that we are humans. Um, so it kind of took that, that entire assessment to, to believe what it had seen. It had to smell it to, to believe it. So has Frank been seen around or have you seen Frank and his mother at all recently? So Bella is still around. Mom, mom is still around. And the last time I saw her would have been in 2022, um, briefly. Um, and she's, she's going to be, you know, 24 years old this year, somewhere around there, 24, 25 years old. So, um, she was meant to have cubs last year. She didn't come back with cubs. Um, so she might have cubs this year, but that, it really depends on food availability, but also, you know, she's, she's getting older, so she's not, um, you know, maybe she might have to be, might have to spend more energy to get the same amount of calories that she did, um, several years ago. So it's hard to say if she's going to come back with another set of cubs, but, um, she is, yeah, she, so she's 24, 25 years old. Um, and then Frank, Frank, I think was spotted on trail cameras. Um, I haven't seen him just grazing in the estuary or grazing the, the shorelines of Night Inlet, but he may have, Oh, you know what? Frank actually traveled all the way to Vancouver Island. Uh, now, now I remember that. I saw pictures of him um, in an estuary um, that's in a very kind of remote portion of Vancouver Island. And people say Vancouver Island is not supposed to have um, grizzly bears, but there are usually grizzly bears that kind of swim across from the mainland inlets or mainland um, uh, forests over to Vancouver Island. And they might spend the spring there, but then realize there's not enough a uh, food source there and then come back over to the mainland um, later on in the year. Um, so Frank was spotted there and then Frank is, I think he ended up, he ended up last being spotted or kind of being a regular um, bear that is seen in, uh, I think it's a place called Phillips Arm, which is quite a bit south of us. So he's he's gone out of his mother's range into a kind of a new area, but he is he is still out and about. So what was the most dangerous or exciting moment that's happened to you while you've been around bears? Oh gosh. I mean, that's, that's a really hard one to quantify the most dangerous or exciting moment. Um, I mean, as a whole, just getting to spend time with bears, I, I wouldn't, I would kind of move away from danger as as kind of uh, the action word there, um, because danger kind of in yeah. Anyway, so I, I'd move more towards um, there's there have been busy moments where there are bears around me that are having to make decisions, um, but it's not it's not necessarily how I view an experience with a, a grizzly bear is as oh you know oh we went in to go and peacefully view this bear and that was dangerous. Um, because it's all kind of very well managed and we, we really take our time and we, we ensure that we're not putting ourselves or the bears into harm's way. That would be counterintuitive if we were kind of taking an unnecessary risk to look at a bear, um, knowing full well that that bear could end up harming us because, you know, that's, that doesn't work out well for us, but ultimately the bear is the one that's going to pay the price. Um, for for getting hurt, so I I don't put my groups into dangerous situations. Um, it's not so, yeah, it doesn't go with with bear viewing. Um, but I have been in some exciting situations, um, which are more comical than than anything. Uh, one of them was actually with Amber, and I've got a picture hanging in my living room from this moment. Um, uh, basically, when when grizzly bears kind of get their mind set on salmon, um, in particular during the fall. And there's, you know, there's salmon swimming up the river and they're in shallow water. And there's kind of this, this buzz and excitement, it feels like among the bears. 
um, they, they basically turn on the blinders and they forget that people are people. They forget, they, they just kind of make us more look, feel like driftwood um, or a log on the beach. Um, they kind of, they, they give us no regard. They're, they're, they're completely focused on catching salmon and, and getting themselves that high calorie, high fat food source. And so there is, there's a couple times in the river, I'd be, I was standing there, again, sitting in the boat. Um, I was actually in probably six feet of water. So I was sitting in the boat and I was holding onto shore. We we're just floating there. But um, about 15 feet um, away, maybe 20 feet away, um, that kind of deep pool that I had been sitting in gets into shallow water and it's a riffle. So the, the water is maybe six inches deep. I can't take a boat there, but a bear can easily kind of run along that, that river bank or that that um, that riverbed and so we're sitting there we're kind of waiting the tide had been dropping a little bit and we see like 300 yards down the way there's Frank and Amber um, kind of they pop out of the forest and they're like zigzagging back and back and forth across the river looking at you know looking for fish and then when when Amber is maybe about 50 yards away in that little shallow riffle um, which is, you know, only 20 feet away from us. And that little shallow riffle, a whole school of salmon start trying to figure their way out up upstream um, to the next deep pool. And there's like this splashing going on. And that's that's like the firing, you know, or like the, the starting gun at a race. And Amber just like perks up, completely focused on that splashing water and starts sprinting directly towards us in like a perfect line to where we're sitting in the boat where but not to us to those fish and she's just like running 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 water splashing everywhere and she like jumps and because she's two and a half years old and doesn't know how to catch salmon she like jumps lands in the water with an explosion of water fish kind of splashing everywhere away um but nowhere near her paws um it was quite a funny like it was quite a quite a funny thing to watch as as she she really had a terrible fail um but yeah, kind of that that direct sprint towards us. I've also had another experience with a bear where I was standing in the river. This time I was I was kind of I was ferrying people across the river to our vehicle because we had been in a viewing stand. Um, I was ferrying people across the river in the boat, and I get down. I'm in the boat. I've got some people sitting in the boat, and sure enough, about 75 yards up the river, a bear comes around the corner, and it's you know maybe like a four and a half or five and a half year old bear. Again, kind of on the younger side of things, still trying to figure things out. And a similar thing happens where uh, there's a bunch of fish in a riffle behind us and they start splashing. And it's just like the firing gun go or the starting gun goes and the bear just starts sprinting. Um, except this time there's no deep water between us and the bear starts sprinting directly towards me. Um, and it's like, if if I hadn't had kind of turned sideways, made myself a little big and said, hey, bear a few times, um, I think that bear probably would have shoulder checked me on the way to the salmon. And so it was kind of hilarious. I like turned sideways and said, hey, bear, and then still sprinting, no response. And I kind of like got a little bigger, a little broader, hey, bear again. And then the uh, the, the bear kind of like slowed down and it really felt kind of like it was like whoa are you going for that salmon and it like slowed down kind of moved about five or six feet away from me um doing a semicircle until it was like just beyond me and then it started running again and jumped splashed in the water and of course being a young bear didn't catch anything wow thank you for sharing those stories <laughs> yeah no problem <laughs> unfortunately that's going to be the last question that we do have time for today <laughs> So I'm going to throw it back to you for some closing comments. Um, folks, I, I hope you enjoyed the story of one bear's life. Um, something I find endlessly fascinating about grizzly bears is, you know, all bears have kind of an interesting life history. And it's it's quite quite a long road from being kind of that, that bumbly, curious, doughy-eyed cub um, to maneuvering their way through the hardest part of a bear's life, uh, which is sub-adulthood, and then becoming either, uh, you know, a, a breeding age and, and kind of a more confident bear. Um, it's a, a privilege to be able to go back to those same areas and to see bears um, come back to the same areas and, and feed. And I do hope that the next bear viewing experience you have, um, 
you you find that same kind of connection that I found with grizzly bears. And uh, yeah, enjoy enjoy your day. Thank you very much. Eddie, thank you so much for taking the time to present for us today. And I'd also like to thank everyone who tuned in today. If you're interested in information on how you can travel with NatHab, give us a call at the number on your screen, or you can send us an email at info at nathab.com. Our adventure specialists are happy to help you out. Join us tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links, on our website at nathab.com slash webinars. We did record today's presentation, and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I will conclude the webinar. Goodbye, everybody. We'll see you next time.